Greetings everyone, my name is Moussa Boukersh. I'm a senior consultant engineer at Eli Lilly in Indianapolis, and I'm responsible for the development of scalable crystallization process. More importantly, I'm the proud father of two boys, Oscar and Arthur, to whom I would like to dedicate that talk. I'm glad you can join us today for this webinar. We're gonna talk about the process development monitored with process analytical tool for molecules that exhibit liquid liquid phase separation. I hope you will forget the happy little accidents that I can have during that talk. And to paraphrase Bob Ross, it's time to have fun, let's get crazy. Liquid liquid phase separation or demixing phase is commonly known as oiling out. In the pharmaceutical industry, it's often encountered by chemists when they develop a synthetic route for an API. It describes the presence of oil droplets in a continuous phase. The first step is the formation of these oil droplets from an initial single phase solution. And these droplets will grow by coalescence, as you can see on this video. So from um, a process perspective, it is an undesired phenomena as it will lead to the formation of an impure sticky amorphous solid which basically is the opposite of what you should expect uh, from a controlled crystallization process not mentioning that on scale up it can also damage the equipment so LPS can occur for different physical reasons and has been described for different type of molecules it has been first reported for inorganics more than 130 years ago it has been reported for large molecules such as protein, uh, peptide, or polymers. And in this work from Vekilov on proteins uh, give rise to, gave rise to uh, the two-step nucleation theory, and we will talk about that a bit later. And in this paper from Laurent Laferrer, I'm showing you the phase diagram of the polymorphic system uh, where the two polymorphs are enantropic enantropically related there is a crossover temperature um, the green and the blue curve corresponds to the solubility of those two polymorphs the red curve corresponds to the binode which is the liquid liquid equilibrium uh, of the two phases if you cool down a solution at a given concentration uh, the first oil droplets will occur uh, at the contact with the spinodal curve the relationship between the spinodal curve and the Binode, the spinodal curve is a kinetic boundary, whereas the spinode is a thermodynamic boundary. So this can occur as well by concentration uh, of a solution. And you can see in this case that the binode and the spinode are very similar. This is typically the profile that you should expect if you are a chemist uh, when you try to isolate your reaction mixture um, from a rotalap. But LLPS is a reversible process. If you warm up a solution, uh, it will become clear again for temperature situated above the binode or by dilution of a concentrated solution. The last case is uh, of reversibility is by addition of a good solvent uh, in your system. Another type of phase diagram that I found in this paper from Lotti Derdour is the following one where the binode crosses the uh, solubility and give rise to the formation of a domain where the LLPS is stable. In other words, the oil droplets will never crystallize. Now, if you cool down the solution from point B, the LLPS is metastable and the droplets will crystallize, like this example here of ibuprofen from methanol water, where you can see the nucleation, the growth now, and the growth is limited by mass transfer you can see some diffusion as well or you can guess some diffusion of solvent so the crystal in the vicinity of the crystal uh, we don't see any more oiling or droplets and it's growing this uh, droplet has been just seeded and because it's super saturated the the crystal is growing and you can see also the formation of a secondary nuclei on the surface and this growth will keep on going uh, until uh, the system reaches the solubility. And as it evolves towards the solubility, it becomes back to a, um, this time 
a biphasic solution but a solid liquid. So in this talk, I will focus only for LLPS in the case of a ternary system where a good and a bad solvent, bad, I mean anti-solvent, are fully miscible in their range of composition and temperature. But the presence of a third entity, the solute, uh, will force the system uh, to uh, um, phase split and will deliver an ugly system. Maybe it rings a bell. I don't know. After this introduction, I would like to propose you the following outline for my talk today. We'll start with the first experimental part where I will show you how we generate uh, phase diagrams for two compounds and how, in addition to the knowledge of this phase diagram and the monitoring of PAT, we develop uh, crystallization uh, processes. We'll then move to a, a more fundamental approach on LLPS where uh, from a thermodynamic approach, I will show you why the supersaturation in the two phases are similar and why this supersaturation should be also similar to the supersaturation before LLPS occurs. Using a kinetic approach, I will explain you why these droplets will eventually crystallize and should crystallize first. We will then end up this talk with some conclusions and perspectives where I would try to sh show you how we can turn lemons into lemonade. In other words, how we can take advantage of an unwanted, undesired phenomena to our advantage in the world or in the field of chemical engineering. I will then join you for the Q&A session. Let's start with this first case study. Compound A is a sweeter ion, where an hydrogen is moving from a carboxylic acid to a secondary amine. It crystallizes as a monohydrate, and it was the desired form until the fourth manufacturing campaign of the API. However, it needed the use of um, wet nitrogen in order to, during drying in order to maintain its hydration uh, level and avoid the collapse of the structure into an amorphous phase. It is formulated as a spray dry dispersion of the sodium salt. So the aim of this work was to uh, develop uh, direct isolation of this monohydrate from the crude reaction mixture in preparation of the API 5 campaign. And in this case, the control of the PSD is really to improve the filtration performance. Since we started this work, a new form, a anhydride form, uh, occurred or appeared, and that then became the targeted form. The, the advantage of the anhydride form uh, is that we, don't, we didn't need to have so much control or the use of wet nitrogen during drying. We started by mapping the LLPS or the phase diagram of this compound using Crystal 16. The principle of the experiment is to uh, monitor with a turbidity probe uh, the evolution of a slurry contained in a vial, and this vial will undergo a series of heating and cooling ramp. During the first heating, we can determine a temperature of dissolution. Uh, for this condition, the turbidity signal is high because the, the light can go through the, the, the clear solution. We know we can associate this temperature of dissolution to the concentration in solution as we have um, prepared that uh, vial with a known amount of solid and a known amount of solvent. During the cooling, we can measure a cloud point. And the difference of solubility and, and the difference of temperature between those two points correspond to the metastable zone width. At the clown point, uh, two different things can happen, two different events can happen, either the primary nucleation of, of crystals or the formation of oil droplets. In order to discriminate between those two events, we performed a second heating ramp where we measure a clear point. 
this cycle of temperatures can be repeated many times in order to uh, measure the repeatability of the metastable zone width. Now, three different cases can occur. If the clear point uh, is similar to the temperature dissolution, then the cloud point corresponds to the nucleation, the primary nucleation of the same crystalline phase. If the clear point is similar to the cloud point, then it's LLPS, and what we are measuring is the uh, sp spy node during cooling and the by node during heating. And the last case is where the temperature, the clear temperature, is different than the temperature of the solution or the cloud point. In this case, you can suspect the formation of a new phase. So all the residues are analyzed by XRPD, and if we identify a new form, then we will perform a, a combined DSCTGAMS in order to know if it's a true polymorph, a solvate, and what type of solvate it can be. And we check the integrity of the molecule by HPLC to make sure that the molecule didn't react with the solvent to give uh, an impure uh, form. And uh, we check the, the integrity of the molecule with NMR to make sure that we are dealing with the same molecule and also that we don't have, we are not in the presence of a desmotrop, for instance. So this approach is used for different concentration. And here you can see the phase diagram of compound A in a 60-40 IPA water mixture, water being the anti-solvent. So for all the different points, we observed um, um, some oiling. But there are some outliers here that uh, uh, occur during the heating ramp. And in fact, it's because we formed an unstable LLPS or oil droplets that eventually crystallize. So this can happen if the induction time for the nucleation of this, uh, the crystallization of these oil droplets is lower than the time spent by the solution uh, in the metastable zone width during the cooling and heating ramp. We had the opportunity to test the last version of the PVM probe and we wanted to compare the refractive backscattering index trend in green on this uh, graph against the total number of counts given by the FVRM in black in this graph. We uh, can see that those two trends are very similar. And we, uh, for this experiment, we operated a succession of heating and cooling ramp uh, for different heating and cooling rate. And using the same approach as described previously for the Crystal 16, we could confirm that uh, these events are associated with the liquid-liquid phase separation. Here on this video, you can see the formation of uh, the oil droplets that are coalescing and then they are wetting the, the probe window. In this case, we are demonstrating that the uh, LLPS zone is not sensitive to uh, the change of cooling and heating ramp. So this experiment is a part of a larger experiment where we try to automate the definition of the phase diagram for a given composition, but for different concentrations. So for that purpose, we performed a series of uh, temperature cycling in addition to a series of dilution using the same composition of solvent. Globally speaking, uh, the PVM is, the, a very is a more suitable probe uh, for this kind of work because it can remove the ambiguity between the primary nucleation of crystals, uh, a true LLPS, and LLPS for which the old droplets will crystallize, as we will see uh, in, um, later on this, on this presentation. With these experimental data in hand, usually we uh, develop a model in order to get access to the solubility for any composition at any temperature. But as the binode is also a thermodynamic uh, curve, we can do the same approach and model the LLPS uh, boundaries, as you can see on this graph.
with the knowledge of the phase diagram, we can then start designing a seeded crystallization process at easy max scale. You can see on this graph that the metastable zone width can be subdivided into different zones limited by kinetic curve that will move for different uh, processing condition. So the principle is to define seeded condition in terms of temperature, supersaturation, seed load in order to grow a seed to a desired final particle size distribution by transfer of the solute from the solution to the crystal surface of the seed. If the seed surface is not sufficient with regards to the generation of the supersaturation, then the, the system can hit the secondary nucleation zone and it will typically deliver a, bi a bimodal particle size distribution that will impact the filtration performance in addition to the physical properties of the API, such as the bulk and tap density, the flow, um, and sometimes as well the pharmacokinetic of the API. We can change the level of supersaturation for a given temperature as well, or uh, vary the seed loading for a given size seed. At that stage, usually uh, the kinetics for crystallization and growth are not known. Um, so we have to deal with that in order to develop a robust crystallization process. Regarding compound A, we uh, looked at two different seeding points at 45 degrees with two initial supersaturation, different seed load, different seed quality, micronized and standard seeds. And the cooling ramp, seed aging and thermal cycle are identical for the different uh, experiments. If you cool down a solution without any seed, it will hit the spy node for which oil droplets will start to nucleate and these old droplets will eventually crystallize and followed by the nucleation of the continuous phase and the formation of needle-like crystals. So if for the first seeding point at 100 gram per liter, this is the trend given by the SVRM. At that time we didn't have eye control, so I apologize if I don't have the temperature um, evolution on this graph. Anyway, what we can see is like the first uh, drop of the TNC total number of counts is due to the dissolution of the initial slurry. The solution is cooled down to 45 degrees and seeded and you can see that the seed held but as soon as we started like to nucleate to uh, uh, to cool down the solution a huge wave of nucleation, secondary nucleation occurs during most of the cooling ramp which means that the metastable zone width limit for the secondary nucleation uh, looks like that. We then perform a thermal cycle, uh, which corresponds to that drop of the total number of count, um, which corresponds to the fine dissolution by Oswald ripening. And uh, during the final cooling ramp to the isolation temperature of 15 degrees, no more secondary nucleation occurs, which means that at that stage, we have enough surface to absorb, or the system have, en have enough surface to absorb the supersaturation generated during this cooling. This is the full profile of the for two, uh, five, and ten percent of, of seed. On the left hand side, the particles are made of grown seeds plus these uh, needle-like crystals that occurs uh, during secondary nucleation and post thermocycle. Uh, those fine particles disappear by dissolution. If we take a look at the higher supersaturation, we increase the, the throughput in order to uh, increase the yield of recovery as well. So we have this kind of profile. So with one and 2%, uh, the red and the green curve, we can see a uh, high increase of the total number of counts, which is characteristic 
um, of the nucleation of oil droplets in this case, and a drop followed by a drop of the total number of counts, which corresponds to the coalescence of these oil droplets. So if we look at the correspondence on the phase diagram, so first of all, look at the crystals. You can see on the left hand side that we have a mixture of spherical agglomerated or oil droplet, crystallized oil droplets, ground seeds, uh, in addition to uh, needle-like crystals coming from the secondary nucleation. So it means that the desupersaturation is not fast enough to avoid the contact with the uh, spinode during the cooling. However, after thermocycle, we uh, can then uh, burst the agglomerates with the heating, and that's the, this increase of the total number of counts uh, that you can see uh, to finally deliver more kind of acceptable um, slurry, but with a high specific um, resistance of the cake, around 10 to the 10th meter per kilogram. For the 5 and 10 percent weight seed load, we don't observe this. Uh, uh, we don't detect any LLPS during cooling, and the final crystals have a very good quality. And despite an an acceptable uh, filtration performance of 10 to the ninth of meter per kilogram. The last case is when we use like uh, the same amount, one, two, five, and ten percent of micronite seeds. You can see that we don't detect any secondary nucleation, and we didn't need to do a thermocycle in this case, which means that the surface available for growth is sufficient to absorb the supersaturation which is created during the cooling run. However, the quality of the crystals, or at least the filtration performance of the um, of the slurry was not sufficient. Uh, we had like a high compressibility index and high uh, specific resistance of cake. So we uh, didn't use that um, quality of seed in addition to the fact that uh, this quality of seed was not available for the next campaign. The purpose of this, of this slide is to raise a flag if you are using crude solution that contains inorganic. On this graph, which represents the pH dependent solubility of our compound, we can see that uh, the solubility is increasing at high pH. The previous step is an hydrolysis of a methyl ester using sodium hydroxide. And in order to improve the yield of recovery, we perform the pH shift by addition of HCl into the zone where the solubility is the lowest, around pH 4 but for which we maintain the sweeter ion or at least the free acid in solution. So when, upon the addition of the, of the HCl, we can see some haziness and looking under the microscope, it corresponds to an LPS. But when we add an extra amount of water to get the, the composition needed for the crystallization process, this haziness disappeared. In reality, uh, this LLPS occurs not for our API, because in this case, the solution is more milky visually, but this occurred because of the formation of sodium chloride. I've seen the same kind of behavior with the potassium carbonate in a mixture of alcohol water or in a mixture of THF water as well. Let's talk about the second case study. The compound B is an intermediate and it's crystallized from ethanol water. Its solubility exhibits a synergistic behavior, which means that the maximum concentration is achieved with the presence of a bit of anti-solvent, in this case, roughly 20 to 25% of water. Uh, the purpose of this work was to deliver quickly a process that avoids LLPS that uh, because it impacts the impurity profile of this product and improve the yield of recovery as well. We didn't have much time to develop this process and I'm going to describe you step by step what we did. So based on the work from uh, Kisov, we used the same approach to determine the ternary phase diagram using regressed unipack model. 
you can see that the blue curve corresponds to the trajectory of the process. In other words, just the evolution of the concentration due to the dilution upon the addition of the anti-solvent. The red curve is the evolution of the solubility. It has a weird trend, but in fact, it reflects the nature of the syn synergistic solubility. You can see that the initial process that was developed uh, ended up in the LLPS zone. However, this approach is interesting um, because you might be able like, to select a pair or identify and select a pair of solvent and anti-solvents which doesn't exhibit um, any LLPS. So we started with some crude material and we quickly screen the conditions for which it will oil. We dissolve this product, the crude material, in three volume of ethanol, pure ethanol, and we added increment of water, 2566, sorry, 2533 and 50% of water. And uh, for each addition, we cool down quickly the, the solution to determine if any LLPS can be detected for this composition. Once we saw that uh, for 50-50, it didn't LLPS uh, um, up to 20 degrees, we cooled down the solution at 40 degrees, we sealed it, and as soon as the rest of the anti-solvent was added, you can see a characteristic uh, behavior of uh, an LLPS event that occur for roughly 45% of ethanol, so 55% of water. This deliver these agglomerates uh, that have a very bad impurity profile. So in order to tackle this issue and develop a, a robust process, we then determine the phase diagram uh, for this compound for three different compositions uh, at 60, 65 and 70 percent of water. And the same approach as previously, we perform a series of thermocycle in addition to a series of dilution at the same composition to screen uh, a different concentration. What we can see is that for the 60% of water, the first point crystallized, but the rest of the rest of the profile corresponds to LLPS, and LLPS occurs systematically at 65 and 70% of water. Using the experimental data, we can then draw the phase diagram for this compound and start the design of the crystallization process. We can see that this compound or for this system, uh, there is the existence of a stable LLPS zone. I would like to draw your attention to those two points here. And if we decide to use two, if we consider two uh, different temperature for seeding at 60 and 45 degrees, LLPS is highly, highly likely to occur at 60 degrees. The reason for that is if you see the solution at 60, 40 and let the, the system evaluate and evolve until uh, it reaches the solubility at 60, 40, the next step to gain some uh, yield of recovery is the addition of more anti-solvent to reach uh, 70, 30 percent. And in this case, because the solubility at 60-40 is above the LLPS or the binode uh, curve uh, for the next composition, which is 60-35, LLPS is highly likely to occur. Now, if we use the same initial concentration, but at 45 degrees, the supersaturation, the initial supersaturation will be higher. But in this case, uh, uh, at the end of the, the seed aging, if the compound reaches the solubility at 60-40, this solubility point is below the binode of the next uh, composition of 65-35. So in this case, LLPS can be avoided. So with this phase, this phase diagram, we can also design, and that's what we did, design a continuous process using two MSMPR based on the, on the phase diagram and on this uh, batch data. So here is the crystallization process that we developed. Um, 
the solution is seeded at 45 degrees then uh, the seed is aged for an hour to help the super saturation then water is added over uh, four hours in order to generate a slow uh, super saturation rate and help the growth of the crystals and you can see that the FBRM trend didn't show any sign of oiling. The first event that is detected by the probe is uh, a drop of the total number of counts, which corresponds to an agglomeration, but more likely to due to an dilution effect. Then a slight increase that corresponds to a secondary nucleation just upon the start of the cooling ramp to the isolation temperature, and a drop that corresponds to and agglomeration. You can see the particles that are obtained uh, on the right hand side, on the micrograph on the right hand side, and they look quite good uh, with little amount of agglomerates. This uh, process was then scaled up and we modified a few uh, parameters for scale up. Um, and it delivered a very high quality compound uh, without any LLPS occurring. We'll start a more fundamental discussion on NLPS and we will try to understand why the old droplets crystallize. If they are crystallizing, it's because they are supersaturated and they can deliver this kind of urchin, sea urchin type of morphology. Based on the classical theory of nucleation, the formation of a new phase will occur with the concomitant fluctuation of a density and structure. The two-step nucleation theory indicate that those two fluctuations are independent and the first step is the formation of a dense liquid phase in which the nucleation will occur and deliver after growth this type of particles. The model is based on the single nucleation or the nucleation of a single crystal per droplet of a crystal level size. However, from a practical point of view, we can observe the nucleation of many crystals in a single droplet, and that will lead to different type of morphology, as you can see here. And the question is, if this, the, the oil droplet is supersaturated, what about the continuous phase? answer this question. I uh, will refer to that paper, that paper from Bonnet, where the, the, the author indicate that um, for the rich and the solute lean phases, because they are in equilibrium with each other, the solute chemical potential and hence the supersaturation for the solute in each phase should be identical. How can we demonstrate that? So if we consider a single phase, with the Gibbs free energy delta G that transform into this biphase uh, characterized with a delta G1, a Gibbs free energy within the droplets and delta G2, a Gibbs free energy um, in the continuous phase. Delta G1 and delta G2 and delta G can be uh, described as a difference of chemical potential where mu1 is the actual chemical potential uh, for the actual solution and new equilibrium one is the chemical potential at equilibrium so for the solubility where in this equation x1 corresponds to the molar fraction so the actual concentration in solution x equilibrium one the concentration at equilibrium so the solubility gamma one and gamma equilibrium one being the activity coefficient in the actual solution and at equilibrium by rearranging uh, the previous equation we get to this formula and if we apply the same approach for the second phase we get the same type of formula because the solution the, the two phases are at equilibrium delta g1 equal delta g2 if we replace with the previous uh, mathematical equation then we get uh, this first uh, equilibrium if we assume that for each in each phase that for instance in phase one gamma one and gamma equilibrium one, so the activity coefficient are similar, then 
we can demonstrate that effectively the super saturation in both phases is similar or is equal let's consider the evolution of the gibbs free energy with the composition starting from pure a we can see that the gibbs free energy is decreasing and is minimal for the binode at that point xab uh, miscibility gap is created but the first oil droplets will occur for this inflection point which is the spinosal points for which these conditions are verified once the single phase will split the two phases will be at equilibrium for xab and xba composition let's get back to our system with uh, phase one and phase two at the binode the uh, delta j mix is equal to x1 delta g1 plus x2 delta g2 if we consider that delta g is the free gibbs energy of the clear phase just before the mixing we can see that the delta j mix so the gibbs free energy of the demixed phase is equal or slightly lower than the gibbs free energy of the single phase initial single phase because delta g1 and delta g2 e equal delta g2 and the sum of the molar fraction equal to one it means that the anti the um, gibbs free energy of mixing is equal in the two different phases but also it means that the super saturation in the phase one which is equal to the super saturation in the phase two is lower than or equal or lower to the super saturation in the single phase in other words it means that if you know the solubility of the single phase you can then predict the super saturation of the demixed phase without the need of sampling uh, individual phases and uh, uh, analyze them uh, experimentally by hplc nmr etc etc in the case of LLPS, we've seen that both phases are equally supersaturated. And in order to explain why the, the oil droplets crystallizes first or should crystallize first, I would like to use the same kinetic approach used by Boistel to explain why a metastable form is kinetically favorable, despite the fact that it's less supersaturated. So Boistel used this type of uh, model for the nucleation rate. So there are all the models for the nucleation rate are based on an Arrhenius type of equation. They only differ by their pre-exponential factor. If we then take a look at the uh, activation energy, Boistel explained that the difference of interfacial tension crystal liquid, gamma Cl, which is in cube in that formula has more influence than a variation in supersaturation to reduce the deactivation energy. Mersman give that formula in order to calculate the interfacial tension and say uh, corresponds to uh, the solubility of the compound and basically the higher the solubility the lower the interfacial tension and the lower the activation energy. So Wastel did a calculation based on this model, on this model, and he used the same pre-exponential value of 10 to the 20 and a different supersaturation for two phases. We can see that beta one is less supersaturated because it's more soluble, so it's the metastable form. And he shows that for a slight change of the interfacial tension, the number of nuclei which is generated for the metastable form is 2.4 10 to the seventh number of germs per meter cube per second whereas for the stable form it's only four germs per second so there is a huge order of difference and it shows that it's unlikely that the stable form will spontaneously nucleate for an homogeneous uh, nucleation Eventually, Sato showed that what is important to compare in order to evaluate the prevalence of one form over the other 
the other one it's to look at the ratio gamma cube over ln square of beta for each phase If we now apply this approach for the uh, LLTS, we know that the supersaturation in both phases is equal, but the droplets are rich in the good solvent, which means that it's, the, it's uh, more soluble than the, the product is more soluble than in the continuous phase, which means that the energy of activation is lower which in turn means that the nucleation rate enhanced the induction time for the formation of a nuclei is lower as well in the oil droplets. So the oil droplets should crystallize first. In this talk, I showed you that the RBI trend of the PVM probe is similar to the SDRM total number of count. This PVM probe is the most suitable tool to study a molecule that exhibits LLPS determine its phase diagram and develop a seeded crystallization process. For compounds that are prone to LLPS, the development of crystallization process is no more different than for a typical molecule. Regarding the LLPS event, from a thermodynamic approach, I showed you that the supersaturation in the dispersed phase is similar to the supersaturation of the single phase before demiction. And based on the kinetic approach, I explain you why the oil droplets should crystallize first. We could take advantage of this natural behavior to design spherical crystallization process to enable and en enhance benefits in terms of pro processability of the drug substance, filtration rate, uh, washing, drying, and also improve the physical property for a drug product by improving the flowability, the bulk and tab density, and control the final particle size distribution. We can deliver spherical crystals that would not need the use of surfactant or a mixture of immiscible solvent, anti-solvent binder, uh, as it is uh, currently used for spherical agglomeration. We can use wet meal to control the droplet size distribution, trigger the nucleation in the droplets with sonication, and apply that for a continuous process. The key point to deliver only spherical agglomerates is to understand where the secondary nucleation zone stands with regards to the binode. To end up my talk, I would like to draw some perspectives on the use of the PVM for the determination of a 2D, 2D crystal growth kinetic. The determination of the growth kinetic of a single crystal from the flow cell is not representative of the growth kinetic of the entire crystal population. However, we could take advantage of the blinding of the, FVRM, of the PVM probe to uh, maybe extract some kinetics by image analysis here you can see the, the crystals that are stuck on the probe you can see also the formation of twinned crystals and maybe in the future we'd be able like to extract those data or use this kind of data to extract a 2d growth uh, growth kinetics the challenge though would be to be able to uh, stick few particles on the PVM window in order to extract those kinetics. Now my talk is uh, coming to an end. I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention and I'm getting ready to answer your question. Thank you very much.